This video is brought to you by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. Outdoors Delmarva covers everything outdoors. Including real hunting and fishing situations involving wildlife. We do our best each and every week to keep it tasteful, but discretion is advised. Now, enjoy the show. This is Outdoors Delmarva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. This week on the show. We trade in our rod and reels for some bow and arrows and head out on the Chop Tank River with our sights set on stingrays. Hit, hit, hit. You remember those flounder we caught a couple of weeks ago? Well, we're down here in Nanticoke with Jeanette Jones to cook them up. A couple more minutes and we'll get it out. And the Nanticoke Indian Museum is a great way to see how Delmarva's first inhabitants interacted with their environment. Captain Willie takes a tour and learns about ancient hunting and fishing techniques. Right now on Outdoors Delmarva. This is Outdoors Delmarva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. And now, here's Andrew Taws. Thanks for watching Outdoors Delmarva. I'm Andrew Taws. We'll be checking in with my partner, Captain Willie Dykes, in just a few minutes. Well, we decided to trade in our rod and reels for some good old fashioned bow and arrows. and met up with some familiar faces to do a little bow fishing. Now, if you remember a couple months ago, we went out on a pond in Wicomico County to do bow fishing for carp. And now we're out here on the Chop Tank River looking to set our sights on stingrays. The Chop Tank is more than living up to its name for this adventure. Extra choppy is a good way to describe the river as Billy Hardesty and crew leave the boat ramp for today's bow fishing expedition. Look at this. Ride. Terrible. <laughs> I should have stayed home. Another downside that comes with a bumpy ride is decreased visibility. Bow fishing in the shallows requires a good line of sight. With being choppy, it just makes it very difficult to see anything on the surface. Um, and, you know, the water's churned up. It's not as clear as what it might be if it were calm. That wasn't the case a year ago when there was hardly a breath of air, and the cow nose rays were spotted nearly everywhere. We finally arrived at the first stop and begin scouting for any signs of stingrays. We usually do pretty well in this spot. We haven't yet this year. A friend of mine shot him up here like two weeks ago. Since cow nose rays usually swim in schools, it makes them a little easier to see in the shallows, but the wind has really stirred things up. Usually when you see one, you'll see several. Sometimes they get up on top and you'll see, you see their fins, the tips of their wings come up out of the water. So on to the next spot and almost immediately. Right there, right there. A ray just off the boat, so the first shooters gear up and get ready. And in water this shallow, an eye must be kept on our surroundings. If I hold on tight, because there's definitely uh, stumps. As sediment is stirred up, Brandon is remaining optimistic about the rough conditions. This is probably going to be one of the best fights we've ever had, because not only are you going to have the fish, but you're going to have the waves and the wind fighting against you as well. Somebody is going to go overboard today. Turns out Brandon is right, but not because of a fish. We've run aground and Billy is knee deep in the chop tank. Back in deeper water, the search is on without any luck. Brandon and Brett continue to keep a keen eye on the surface, but no rays have been seen since arriving. It always starts off slow until you find it. <laughs> but we will find it. Billy takes a turn in the bow along with Katie Nuttall, and almost right away, Billy spots one. Pretty good. But he's just a little late. Big one just took all right through there. He misses a couple more times, and that has Brandon wondering. So I think he's seeing things, because nobody else has seen it yet. Right, he's shooting figments of his imagination. Billy shoots again, and this time, the line takes off. Oh, yeah, you're right. There's none here. There's none. That's my imagination. The first ray is in the boat, and this fish is certainly no stranger to the bay. Dave Namazi with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science explains. There's some speculation of whether population's getting bigger or not. 
Uh, one of the main predators are sharks, and uh, the population of sharks has been going down globally, primarily due to overfishing in the world's oceans. Um, so there's some speculation that perhaps their populations are getting larger in the Chesapeake and other coastal waters because there's less predation on them. Some have suggested that in uh, oyster aquaculture settings, uh, depending on how it's done, rays may have a pretty big impact when the spatter first release. There may be plenty of rays in the bay, but these fishermen are having a hard time seeing them. And if they do, it's not for long. Just as soon as you see them, it's like, oh. But Katie and Brandon see one, it's and it's big. Brandon who gets the shot off. And after a little fight, this ray is gaffed and all the board. He hit pretty big, he was going away and got a fucking shot on him. Occasionally, the archers in the bow will come across a cow nose ray, but the pickings are slim. Katie remains hopeful, although she can't help remembering what happened last year. She had a stingray up to the boat, but the guys were not able to get it in. Oh no! Oh, my. No. On to a new location, and there's a ray in front. Brett shoots and misses, but Katie doesn't. Keeping tension on the line, Brandon gets it up to the boat. This ray shakes the gap. They try again. No, 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 no. It didn't, it didn't. But it's gone. <laughs> However, Katie doesn't seem to mind. Yeah, happened last it. year. Happened this year. My fish always have to be difficult. That would prove to be the last ray of the day. But this group of fishermen and women will always be able to say, you should have seen the ray that got away. Get out of the Barbara. Coming up next on Outdoors Del Marva, you remember those flounder we caught a couple of weeks ago? Well, we're down here in Nanticoke with Jeanette Jones to cook them up. But first, did you know? The cow-nosed ray is potentially dangerous because of a venomous barb at the base of its spine. Which famous explorer found out about this barb the hard way? The answer, when we come back. You're watching Outdoors Del Marva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. Sponsored by Ocean City Tourism. Shorts Marine. Shooter's Choice, Sussex Outdoors, and Aurora Agronomy. Outdoors Del Marva will be right back. Did you know? During a voyage in 1608, Captain John Smith was so severely stung by a cow-nosed ray that his crew thought he was going to die. The area on the Rappahannock River where the incident occurred is still known today as Stingray Point. Did You Know is sponsored by North Bay Marine. Well, if you remember back a few weeks ago, Willie and I had a little Flounder 101, and if I remember correctly, I caught the biggest fish, and we've got a couple of those fillets here right now. Well, thanks for reminding me, Andrew. I keep forgetting who caught the biggest one. We're down here in Nanticoke in Wicomico County with Jeanette Jones, and she's going to show us how to cook them up real special. I call this flounder dish Parmesan Crested Flounder. Okay. And we're going to start off by basting it with some lemon juice and a little bit of salt. Just takes very little. You can do both sides if you want. However, I just do the one side. Jeanette, it looks like you have all the ingredients here ready to go. What are we working with? Okay, what we're working with is we're gonna put in, uh, we're getting ready to do the topping now. We're gonna put in a cup of Parmesan cheese, a quarter cup of melted butter, three tablespoons of mayo, two tablespoons of chopped green onion, those onions look fresh. They are fresh. They're right from our garden. And That's two tablespoons way. of lemon juice. And we're just going to mix this all together. And then basically, you just take this mixture and you kind of even it out on all the fillets that you have. This will do uh, one and a half to two pounds of flounder fillet. So then we just want to spread this over the flounder. Okay, kind of even it out over the fillet. Mm-hmm. 
Now in the oven, is this topping going to brown? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put it in the oven for 10 minutes, let it bake, and then I'm going to turn on the broiler um, and keep an eye on it. It'll probably be about two minutes, and that'll make that Parmesan crust on it. I see. That was pretty quick. This is quick and easy, and anybody can do it, and we're getting ready to put it in the oven. Okay. Okay. Jeanette, uh, I guess you don't get a lot of flounder down here right in the uh, Nanticoke Tiascan area. What kind of fish do you usually end up uh, catching right offshore here? Well, usually what we get is uh, rockfish, perch, uh, croaker, uh, and trout. And then the red drum, when the red drum season is in, that's basically the kind of fish we get here. We get very few flounder, but we do get flounder once in a while. Hmm. Okay, they're definitely getting me. I think I'm going to turn the boiler on now, and we'll brown it up and get that Parmesan crusted. Now, how long do you usually figure the broiler is going to take to brown up? It's the going crust? to be uh, about two minutes. You Couple just have minutes. to watch it. The cooking is the easy part. It's always the waiting that's the toughest. Yeah. Well, I think the toughest is a cleanup. I can't well. seem to get anybody to clean up. Well, I had an appointment here a little later. I might not be able to make it for the cleanup. <laughs> Oops, yeah, we better get it out now. Ah. All right, here it is. Okay. Here's the sizzle. Oh, wow, yeah. If the taste is anything like the aroma and the sizzle, this is going to be pretty special. That's the truth. And today we're going to be serving it with uh, red skin potatoes, asparagus, and fresh tomatoes with basil. That's fresh basil too, isn't it? That's fresh basil ah. from our herbal garden and fresh uh, potatoes from our backyard. Wow, that is a beautiful presentation. Call it Andrew. Tails. Sorry. Oh, wait a minute. I thought I saw a tail. Oh, it was a tail. Instant replay. Here you go, Captain. <laughs> it's so beautiful, it hardly looks real. Let's check it and see. He's with the crust on here. If it wasn't real, there wouldn't be steam coming off of it. <laughs> Mm. Parmesan really makes it pop. Wow. Well, Jeanette, thank you very much. This is really delicious. Thanks for having us down. Well, you're certainly welcome. I hope you enjoy your dinner and come back to our kitchen anytime. Coming up next on Outdoors Del Marva, you can learn a lot about a people by the way they interact with their environment. And our visit with some of Delmarva's first inhabitants was a treat for the eyes as well as the mind. Outdoors Delmarva will be right back. You're watching Outdoors Delmarva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. Thanks for watching Outdoors Delmarva. I'm Captain Willie Dykes. This monument near Oak Orchard in Sussex County is in memory of Lydia Clark, the last of the Nanticokes to speak her native language. And it's just one sign that the Nanticoke people are still here on Delmarva. Delmarva Outdoors has been home to the Nanticoke people for a little over a thousand years. And that story is beautifully told here in the Nanticoke Indian Museum in the Long Neck. Everything that you see here at the museum is a testament to how the Nanticoke people lived here on Delmarva. It's a look back in time, a snapshot of a culture's efficiency and ingenuity. We're here with Morning Star, the wife of Chief Herman Robbins, and she's going to show us a little bit about how that story is told here at the museum. We lived along the Nanticoke River and we're called the Tidewater People and our logo is the turtle. On display, you'll see a diorama of a Nanticoke village with the tools that saw use on a daily basis. It's not only uh, good for the rest of the world around you, but it's good for you as a person to feel yes. uh, a part of the world, a, 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 an integral part instead of a, an alien. We uh, made our um, wigwams out of bark and um, deer skin and the Air Force Indians came along and taught us how to do the long houses for larger hmm. families and cancer people. Of particular interest were some of the tools that were used in hunting and fishing. Their construction demonstrates that nothing gathered from their surroundings went to waste. Everything has a purpose. 
These simple fishing tools, for instance, use a corn cob bobber. There's a little bone lure here, too. See this little, little lure? Still in this group of dolls has, uh, there's one in the center here. What, the, what, what is that thing made from? This is called an apple face doll, and the head is made from a dried apple, and the body is made from a corn cob, and it's over 100 years old. I've noticed something that all the rest of the dolls have in common. What mm -hmm. is that? As you'll notice, their eyes all look to the right. And they thought looking to the right promoted good health and healing and good luck. I see. All snapping turtle shells have these blocks on them. There are always 13 blocks on them. And there's points around the edge. There's always 28 points. So this was our calendar. It's good to see a lot of foot traffic in the museum as well, and it's the perfect place to take a peek back in time that seems to prove that the bond we have today for the Delmarva Outdoors has a solid foundation with the Nanticoke people. Well, this has been great. Thanks for the tour. Now, we've just scratched the surface here at the Nanticoke Indian Museum. Now, you can find out more on their website at www.nanticokeindians.org and come up to visit them here in Long Neck. Coming up next on the show, we'll meet a breed of dog that just can't keep its paws out of water on this week's Scorchy's Corner Classic. Outdoors Del Marva will be right back. He's designed for plunging into icy water and retrieving. That's when he's the happiest. You're watching Outdoors Delmarva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. Retriever dogs are a big part of outdoor sports here on Delmarva. And on this week's Scorchy's Corner Classic, we'll meet a breed that's all our own when we get to know the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Today we're going to the dogs again, and this time it's a Chesapeake Bay Retriever we're going to pay homage to. A lot of people will tell you that they're hard-headed and stubborn, and that turns on a switch on me, and usually I say it's the, it's the person who's training them. And you can tell a lot by a dog, by the, by the owner who trains them. John Main of Ocean View, Delaware, fell in love with Chesapeake's when he was nine years old. For him, there is no other dog. Five years ago, Mary Main married John, and as it turned out, Chesapeake Retrievers also. We started in 82. I start off with uh, two Chesapeakes, and uh, we start off with uh, hunting at first, and my wife started, she swayed towards uh, showing them, and that's when we started. Today as a team, they train and show Chesapeakes. They average three weekends a month showing their five dogs in competitions over a five-state area. Given his druthers, however, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever would put the show ring last on the list of life's loves. He's a water and marsh dog. His beat is the outdoors. He's designed for plunging into icy water and retrieving. That's when he's the happiest. He's a bear of a dog with a waterproof coat as thick as Puerto Rican molasses. He's tough and he's versatile. They're a multi-purpose dog. You can use them for hunting. They're a good guard dog. They're good around kids, they're a good house dog, and it, not a lot of dogs you can do that with. Yes, the Chesapeake is a different breed of pup. Sort of introverted, a definite workaholic, and first in the hearts of the mains of Ocean View. Scorchy Taws, wandering our dull marvelous land for WBOC News. Coming up next on the show, your latest viewer videos and pictures. Outdoors Delmarva viewer pictures are sponsored by Wink Sporting Goods and we'll be right back. You're watching Outdoors Del Marva, presented by Gateway Subaru. Higher standards. Sponsored by Ocean City Tourism. Shorts Marine. Shooter's Choice. Sussex Outdoors and Aurora Agronomy. It 
Time now to take a look at some of our latest viewer videos and pictures. Looks like there's still some trophy rock in the bay. Michael Matuski Jr. of Salisbury, Maryland caught this 42 inch striper off Deal Island. Nice fish, Michael. Here's another nice catch, this time by Jeff Ebby. He caught this 8.2 pound largemouth bass in a private pond somewhere around Princes Ann, Maryland. Well, after a fun day out on the chop tank ray fishing, it was good to get in the kitchen and eat up some of that flounder we caught a few weeks ago. And as you can see, there is hardly any of the flounder left. And there's nothing left of the show. So for my partner Andrew Tulls and Jeanette Jones, I'm Captain Willie Dykes reminding you to... Get outdoors, Dale Marva.